aspects and never want to experience again because you were, you were coping with a good deal of grief, genuine grief for him personally, and there were agonizing and difficult political decisions to be made. I phoned Tony as soon as I felt I decently could after John Smith's death and said, you've got to stand for leadership. You are the obvious candidate. You're most likely to win both the leadership election and the general election. Um, not only will I back you, but so will everybody I know will back you. Uh, you are the candidate who must stand. And uh, Tony's first reaction was that Gordon had hoped for the leadership, rather anticipated that it might come his way after John Smith had done five or ten years. He never thought of it in those terms. And he was very apprehensive about hurting Gordon. He talked about hurting Gordon. Well, I think people should understand that Tony and I talked constantly uh, from the minute uh, that uh, John Smith uh, died, um, when in fact I think I was the first person to tell Tony that, um, that uh, John was dead. Uh, and uh, I continued to talk to him for a long uh, period of time uh, as um, events unfolded. Of course, the people had asked us not to declare our intentions uh, until after the European elections, which were some weeks away, but I felt I had to clear the air. Peter Mandelson was close to both Brown and Blair. Indeed, they were sometimes regarded as his protégés. After Smith's death, Mandelson played a key role in the party's choice of leader. I think the initial plan revolved around Gordon. I think Tony Blair was a, was a fallback position. Um, in the event, I think Tony emerged as much more voter-friendly than Gordon, and, and so perhaps horses were swapped midstream. I have absolutely no intention of expressing any comment whatsoever on any aspect of the leadership campaign. Gordon Brown was handed the revolver and did the decent thing. We had to make a decision because there was no point in uh, Tony Blair and I standing against each other. We were such uh, close uh, colleagues. We'd worked together over a very long period of time. We had uh, worked on many issues related to the modernization of the Labour Party and we had, uh, of course, uh, our own uh, supporters and our own uh, friends. But um, I recognized it was important for there not to be a contest between the two of us. Tony wasn't a candidate, Gordon would certainly be my choice, but choices had him made. And uh, Tony said, well, uh, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to put it to him, what do I say to him? And I said, you tell him there's been a lot of people in the past who have wanted to be leader of the Labour Party and have come to uh, terms with the fact they weren't going to be, and he has to be part of the line which goes back for a very long way. You have to make up your mind, and it's not so much that you disregard what other people or other people who may be going for the leadership are thinking, uh, but you've got to decide what is the best thing for your, for your party, what is the best thing for your family, what is the best thing uh, for those that are closest to you, and it is a, it's a difficult decision. I was sort of an outsider to the bandwagon for Tony Blair, because it doesn't work for me. I now recognise that I'm a sort of minority, uh, because for most people in the country, it does work. A young, very middle-class, upper-middle-class, sort of attractive young man. It isn't my kind of image of where the Labour leadership should come from. A very useful member of, senior member of a cabinet, maybe. But I've been proved to be wrong in that the overwhelming majority of all bits of the Labour Party thought Tony was the best possible leadership. Um, and the public like him very much. I think the party said, well, we need this kind of leader to win, but we want to be ourselves, so we'll choose Tony and we'll anchor him with John. I think we're complimentary, like salt and pepper. He has a vision of the sort of changes he wants. It comes from his experience and he knows what needs to be done for the Labour Party. My experience is entirely different, it reflects a different experience and background, but those two things are the nature of the Labour Party. Some call it the heart and head. I'd like to think I've got a head as well as a heart, but um, I think there's a lot to be said for that, and together I think we can produce, for the Labour Party at last, a Labour government. On the 20th of May, 1994, leading figures, past and present, gathered in Scotland to bury John Smith. With his death, a link with Labour's past had been severed. A new generation with a very different outlook was poised to take over. 
I think the strategy now is to dismantle the Labour Party. As we know, it linked to the unions with a sense of history and some vision as to what could be done, and to transform it into a democratic party like the American, and uh, to perhaps make it impossible for socialists to remain in the party, whereas previously they were there, but they were accepted. Now I don't know that they will be accepted. I think it's been a, I think it's been a painful process, a painful withdrawal from hope and idealism. It may or may not have been necessary. I don't believe that it was. And I think we have simply given up. And we will secure power, but I don't think we'll make much of it. And we will, as soon as the voters recover their confidence in the Tories, we'll be removed in order to make room for the real thing. If we end up torturing ourselves with this, this belief that all you know, all this modernization process is, is an attempt to sort of shadow the conservatives or become like the conservatives, then we'll just fail. I mean, we'll just be completely doomed to failure because every part of sensible change, bringing the Labour Party back as a mainstream party, speaking up for people, will go and we'll end up just as a sort of sect, which is what we were in the early 1980s. Many of the party's elder statesmen fear that Labour, in its quest for power, is in danger of losing sight of its founding principles. We had a big idea, which was a more equal, therefore a more free society. Sometimes we called it fairness, sometimes we called it social justice, but our idea was a more equal and more free society. Now that was the idea we should have propagated with determination and consistency, the idea we should have sold to the people, the idea we failed to sell to the people, but it's still the idea, and it's the only idea that socialism can possibly stand for. You've always got to have in mind with a Labour Party that if it isn't a radical party, if it isn't a party of change, if it isn't a party that's committed to making Britain a fairer, more equal society, then that idealism and that enthusiasm, that energy that goes with that will be denied it. And if the Labour Party plays too safe for too long, it will really be denying its own heritage. Since the party's bitter divisions of the early 80s, the strategy of the party's leaders has been to gain power by moving to the centre ground. The old left, for all its complaint, has not succeeded in selling an alternative vision of Labour. For a generation, Labour politicians have spent their careers in opposition. They've seen Britain transformed by a powerful and radical conservative leader. They have never tasted the fruits of power and their political legacy will be a party which has rejected almost everything it stood for when 16 years ago it was cast into the wilderness.